see seats on the pews and quiet so let's begin welcome to Christ Reform Presbyterian Church this second Sunday of Advent December 4th 2022 a couple of announcements um, we will have a Christmas Eve service Christmas Eve is on a Saturday this year so it will be here at 5 p.m. confuses me each year but it's 5 p.m. 5 p.m. Christmas Eve. Now, there will also be regular worship service on Sunday. Uh, I don't think there'll be Bible class on that Sunday, on Christmas, but there will be worship service. And I just want to mention, this might come as a shock to some of you, but Christmas Eve service is a small T tradition, okay? We do it, I support it, I'm happy to do it, I like Christmas Eve service, okay? Worship on Sunday is a big T, apostolic tradition. We are open every Sunday for public worship. So even if Christmas and Sunday coincide, we are open for worship on that Sunday. All right, are there any other announcements? Yes? Anything else? Carol. Remember that in, in two, the Sunday after this next, I, I believe it's the 18th on the calendar. Okay, Sunday yes. the 18th. We're having chili and cinnamon rolls after service and also um, carriage ride. Either car yeah, carriage, carriage or wagon rides. Anything else? I just want to say this. I am so pleased to see children here. We hold that children should be here from age one day, not children, to the day before you're dead or the day you are dead. So happy to have the children here. They're welcome here. Um, what a blessing. Thank you. Uh, not to embarrass, but. Uh, 
uh, visitors, but we do have a senior citizen uh, visitor to us over here, and I think uh, it would behoove us to show hospitality and make sure she's greeted and felt uh, welcome. So, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. I am very senior. <laughs> yes. For the visitors, Grace is a member of this church and a regular attender. She's just been out of town in Arizona, I presume, for a while, and she's back for the holidays. Nice to have back you back. Forever. Back forever. Okay. That's Grace. And she spoiled us again with goodies already. All right. Just got home. Okay. All right. With nothing uh, further announcement wise, uh, please rise and we'll sing our introit on Jordan's Banks. The Baptist Cry, number 159, and What Child of this, Is This, number 27.
creation worships you, the Father everlasting. To you all the angels cry aloud, the heavens and all the powers therein. To you, cherubim and seraphim, continually do cry, Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabbath, heaven and earth are full of the majesty of your glory. Pastor Nate, please be seated. Pastor Nate will have our opening invitation. What child is this? Well, Lord, in the history of redemption, we as Christians of the New Covenant, we know just what that child and who that child ultimately was and is and will continue to be. He's your son. He's God incarnate in human flesh. He is the God-man. And yet, Lord, though we know that, we know that because your spirit has visited us, each individually, each through a covenant of your, with your people, being nurtured in faith, and we come to realize these things clearer with each passing day and each passing Lord's Day. That recognition, Lord, can be so overwhelming, we sometimes wonder if we were ever saved. I've never felt this way before. I have never seen this redemptive historical rollout and the person of Jesus Christ like this ever before. And Lord, we are not to turn ourselves inward to try to find a moment in time. We are to turn ourselves toward you and to confess our demerits to you and to cry out to you, to call upon your name. Lord, save me. Oh, but, but I was saved y y years ago. But, but no, Scripture teaches us that we will be saved. We are saved. We were saved in the past. We are saved in the present. And we will be saved in the future. And we believe that Luther was correct in understanding Scripture that the Christian life is a daily repentance and renewal. And therefore the time in which something concrete has happened is not as important than confessing and in faith clinging to Christ each and every moment of our existence. He's the Lamb of God. He's your son. He's the one who has brought salvation. And we must come to him continuously as he continuously comes to us through your word. Luther was also correct. If you want to understand who God is, then you need to get into the scripture because that's where God has revealed himself. And another church father was correct saying, if you're lacking power, we need to be in the scripture, for therein is the revelation of God's power to his people. And so we gather here on this Lord's Day, and we are anticipating, because of your movement of faith within our hearts, we are anticipating, tasting, and seeing more of your kingdom, even as we gather here collectively to worship, because we know that there's a special presence here amongst your people. You call us to worship together. And so, Lord, we with anticipation await your speaking, await your work in our lives even now. In Christ's name we pray, amen. amen.
join with me in our confession and declaration. First, our confession of sin. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ is risen, and the Spirit has been given. My blood is mine, and I am his. Let us therefore confess our sins as we worship our risen Lord. Heavenly Father, your Son's work of redemption is finished. While our flesh with its desires has been crucified with Christ, making us truly justified, we are yet encumbered with the residue of sin. We desire, yet we push back. We hope, yet there is grief and sadness. We possess, yet not fully. It is this waiting, this not yet, that in part causes our hearts to be heavy. In ways that we cannot fully understand, we sin because we are yet sinners. Forgive us, O Lord, and renew us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. And please take a time of silence uh, for personal reflection and personal confession. And now, for his, Christ's, declaration of grace. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we have confessed together that we are not what we should be. We are sinners. His law justly weighs in, making our conscience feel its transgression. Nevertheless, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ reign supreme. For the joy of gathering his people and in our place, Christ has both fulfilled the law and borne the fury of a just and holy wrath. Our guilt is gone. He has also bound the strong man, freeing us from his bondage. Therefore, with joyous shouts of hallelujah, I declare to you God's work through Christ alone, the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Fire burns, it hurts, it can destroy. Fire also gives warmth and light. The coming of Christ is both a day of judgment and a day of promise. Two candles flickering brightly help us remember that the coming of Christ has many meanings. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and the righteous will look down from the sky. Okay. Why don't you go ahead and light the first one? You need to watch. Oh, okay. catch me. Like that. Push this forward. Press the trigger. Here, let me do that. I guess it might be too hard. I just got my handle. Okay. 
love, we light the second candle in the Advent brief, the Bethlehem candle, and faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. In Micah 5.2 we read, But, but you, O Bethlehem, Ephrath, who are too little to, to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth from me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. At his birth in Bethlehem, there was no room found for Jesus. The ruler of the universe was wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid to sleep in a manger. Remembering that we love only because he first loved us, we pray that God would prepare for himself a place in our hearts. O little town of Bethlehem, till we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Dear God, we have much to do, and our weakness is ever before us. In Advent's light, help us to see what is important, to be who you want us to be, and to do and to do what you would have us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 And now we have our call to praise, which is from Psalm 72. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. May you judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. Let the mountains bear prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. May they fear you while the sun endures and as long as the moon throughout all generations. May you be like rain that falls on the moon grass, like showers that water the earth. In his, in his days may the righteous flourish and peace abound till the moon be no more. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. And now we'll have special music with Becky Doby. try 
tribes on Sinai's hide. In ancient times once gave the law. In cloud and majesty and awe. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to you, O Israel. O Come, strong branch of Jesse, free your own from Satan's tyranny. From depths of hell your people save and give them victory o'er the grave. by your advent here. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night, and death's dark shadows put to flight. Rejoice, rejoice, his wisdom. Ignoring the scriptures means ignoring Christ. Whoever wants to hear scripture, whoever wants to hear God speak should read Holy Scripture. The Old Testament reading is Isaiah 11, 1 through 12 and 16. Hear the word of the Lord. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge what his eyes see, or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and the faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fatted calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, and their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat like the ox. And the nursing child shall pay, play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the for the peoples. For him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. And there will be a highway from Assyria for the remnant of the remains of the, his people, as there was for Israel. And when they came up from the land of Egypt, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from Romans 15, 
1 through 13. Hear the word of the Lord. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the, uh, re the reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. For whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Jesus Christ, that together you may with one voice glorify the Father, glorify God and, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. For the glory of God, Christ, the hope of Jews and Gentiles. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promise given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God in his mercy as it is written. Therefore I praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again it is said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol you. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will come, even he who rises to rule the Gentiles, and him will the Gentiles in him with will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The Gospel reading comes to us from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Hear the word of the Lord. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham our father, for I tell you, God is able of these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn 
but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The word of the Lord. And now, as you're able, let's stand and sing uh, the hymn, What Hope? And Eden prophesied. Um, it's an insert in your book. Well, Happy New Year to everyone. <clears throat> Little late, but late is better than never. Um, and uh, some of you know what I'm doing. Others are clueless, and others don't care, perhaps. Uh, but this is the new year in the Christian calendar. It's Advent, and it started last week. It's different than the natural order of the calendar, which was also influenced by Christianity in terms of the prior to Christ, after Christ. And there's an attempt in our culture to neutralize that Christian configuration of history from B.C. before Christ, A.D. after the year of our Lord, uh, to... BCE, before the Common Era, and uh, after the Common Era. And uh, this is uh, an attempt to de-Christianize a culture and the entire Western civilization of the influence of your faith, the Christian faith. And one of the things I like about the calendar, uh, Christian liturgical calendar, is that it keeps us a little off balance. We've now started a new year and a new focus. Last year there was the focus on the prophets, and I believe this year the focus is on the church fathers and uh, the uh, writings in the historical books and Exodus. And so we've changed now, we, we've, we've pivoted. But we're not leaving the prophets altogether, and indeed Advent has all of these readings from Isaiah, the prophet. To refresh your memory, Isaiah is one of the first major prophets. Uh, the original prophet, some trace to Samuel, uh, who actually anointed King Saul, whom the people demanded, and the Lord let happen. And then there's Elijah and then Elisha. 
And then we come into the era of the major prophets. And Isaiah is one of the first. He is speaking to Israel. He's speaking and warning Judah. And he's forecasting future events. And he's warning all that repentance is a prerequisite and righteousness is a prerequisite to being and experiencing the favor of God. And I hope that's why you're here. Not that whole long story, though part of it, but the favor of God, the sunshine of his favor, in keeping with the one parable that says, uh, the stormy God of whatever and the warmth sun God were, were fighting amongst each other about their powers. And one said, uh, I will show you my power. I will make this man, this person, remove their uh, coat. I, w- I will blow so hard uh, it will force them. Uh, and of course, that didn't force them. They, they hung on to their coat all the more. And, and then the sun came. And it warmed their face. And, and then with a willing and delightful spirit, they removed their coat. The Christian message is a radical message of the favor of God, which we need to have in order to be whom God has called us to be. This is not a religious experience with a small r. This is a climactic, essential experience to reappropriate and have and possess the favor of God. That's why you're here, I trust and I hope. Join with me in a short prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will be with us in our speaking and in our hearing and in our heart's meditation. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. We will be focusing on Isaiah, and chapter 11 is the chapter, though we won't stay there. If you want to open your Bibles, that will help you follow even more. Isaiah is about in the middle of your Bible, uh, just uh, to refresh your memory. The text was already read to us by Meg, and uh, so we're going to jump right in. The title of this sermon is Stumps, Roots, and Branches. And of course you picked up on that, not only in our scripture readings, but in Becky's lovely presentation of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, uh, mentions the stump of Jesse. And uh, in our hymns we have heard of the stump of Jesse and the branch and so on and so forth. The branch, naturally speaking, is described in Scripture as that which is necessary to bear the fruit of a tree. A tree with many branches is a healthy tree. Its roots have been reaching into the underwater of God that comes through the rain that comes and the snow and the water tables and so on. And so a a tree with many branches is a blessed tree. It is a fruitful tree. And we could visit, which we don't have time for, we can see this natural description of the branch and how it's connected with the tree and the tree's connected with the roots and how blessing is just spelling over. And so just to set the tone here now for God taking that and using it, he uses it as the natural way I described it, 
in the text of Scripture. He uses it as a comparison and contrasting. He uses it as a metaphor. He uses it in all kinds of ways. And its ultimate use in Scripture is pointing to the messianic coming of God's anointed one. That's somewhat redundant. The Messiah means the anointed one. And then the Messiah is merged into this verbiage of a shoot, of a stump, and a branch, as we see in the opening of chapter 11. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. A branch from his roots shall bear fruit. Now, what's the context of this? Well, this isn't the first time that the verbiage has been used. We have seen it also in chapter 7. And uh, there, there Isaiah is sent to King Ahaz because I believe it's Egypt and Israel who's fighting with Judah they made a political alliance, and they're coming after Judah. Smaller than Israel, and certainly smaller and less potent than Israel and Egypt together. And God's people are quivering. God's people are seeing the situation for what it really is, and it doesn't look good. So, God knows that. And he sends Isaiah, the prophet, to King Ahaz over Judah. And he knows the situation because he's created it. And he warns Ahaz to not make a particular alliance with Assyria. To defend, to fend off Israel, and Egypt. Don't do it. In chapter 7 of Isaiah, verse 3, the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out to meet Ahaz, you and Shers Jasub, your son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool of the highway to the washer's field. And say to him, be careful, be quiet, do not fear, do not let your heart be faint. You see, God's word comes to us in our deficiency. God's word comes to us in our lack of resources. Now that's not because God delights in a lack of resources, because the ultimate blessing of God's people is in a world that is just showered with everything that you can imagine prosperity is in this world. The metaphors are just gold and silver and bronze and sapphire and, and abundance and, and water and fruit trees and it's just massively present. So God isn't a killjoy. In this world of ours where God comes to us in our lack of resources and in our insufficiency, there's a reason for it. Again, he's not a killjoy. But there's something that sin has done to each and every one of us. And we need to know this. It has, as Luther said in Curvatus say, it has turned us in on ourselves. Now that can be visible in anxiety. That can be visible in terms of prosperity and strength and success, our insufficiencies and our lack of resources isn't limited to a category. It can paradoxically haunt us in our tremendous success, and it can and is somewhat direct in our really lack of resources visibly. 
But do not mistake those outward signs for what the lack of resources and insufficiency is because God is demanding that we all experience it. And no, it's not self uh, criticism or hatred in a sense. God has nothing but a desire for your pride correctly understood. But sin has given us another form of pride. I'm equivocating because Scripture equivocates on these words. There's a pride that's detestable to the Lord, and there's a pride that we're all heading to because we're going to bask in the sunshine of God himself and in his prosperity. I mean, just a couple verses. Jesus says, uh, in, in my Father's house are many rooms. I, I mean, there's so many, it's an abundance. Revelation just showers these superlatives. Uh, we, we can't imagine greater blessing. So it's, it's really not your self-hatred that God is after, except when we deal with us as we are from the fall of Adam and Eve. Then Luther's correct. God attacks us. He does. And he's calling us to obedience. And so here, as we read in chapter 7 of Isaiah, be careful, be quiet, do not fear, do not let your heart be faint. In the midst of an impossible situation. Well, I mean, how, what does God expect? He is attacking us in order to save us. He's attacking us in order to save us. Ahaz, it goes on. They have devised, these two nations have devised evil against you, saying, let us go up to Judah and terrify it. Let us conquer it for ourselves. You see, this is what happened in the garden. This is what sin is. Sin is a rejection of God's rule and reign and putting ourselves in its place. And you say, well, I, don't, I, don't, I have no aspirations to be the President of the United States. But see, this is an internal motion here. It's not to be equated with simply an external desire for power. It's, it's what swirls in your breast. It's your... It's your ego defense against God's attack on you in order to save you. And we all have it. And it's systemic to us. And that's why nice people just, they're confounded by the gospel. I mean, I just don't get this idea that I'm a sinner. I mean, really, I, I'm quite a nice person. You see, but you have to see yourself as God's word portrays us. You have to find your story, your life story, in God's declaration of you, in his story. You're included in here. Every one of us is included in here. He continues through his prophet Isaiah to Ahaz. Their plan to destroy you, God says, it shall not stand. It shall not come to pass. But it's likely, it is so likely, uh, you're faced with just believing some raw words delivered to you by a prophet. That's how unlikely it is. And then God's ominous warning, verse 9 of chapter 7 of Isaiah. If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. 
You see, if, if you miss this attack of God upon you in the very core of your being because of sin, you've missed the gospel. You can't orientate your life. Everything you strive for security and power, God-given competence because he gave you your gifts, all of those things are like Adam and Eve in the garden. You're, you're twisting creation for a purpose that it was not designed for and that makes you an idol maker and creator. Have you ever wondered, you know, I, I mean, I wouldn't worship a totem. I mean, that's silly. I mean, that's back in the days, right? But you have your totem. Calvin is correct theologically. Your heart is an idol factory. Not because you're created in his image, Absolutely not, but because sin has come into the human race and your heart is twisted and evil and you have and are committing treason before the one holy and righteous God. That's you. That's me. Keeping in mind that therefore God's attack upon you is God's attack upon your sinful constructs that shut him out. And we all have that. This is, this is what sin does to us in a twisted way and, and it's deceptive and, and we don't really know it. We're all bathed in self-deception. Jeremiah, the prophet who comes after Isaiah, says the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And the answer to that rhetorical question is, no one. And then the next verse says, God alone knows and searches the hearts of man. So as Christians, you must build on this foundational premise, you are evil. Jesus says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more God being the only intrinsically self-sufficient being who is good, knows how to give good gifts to you. Therefore, we must conclude theologically and by inextricable logic, unstoppable logic, that God attacks you because he loves you. God attacks you because he wants you saved. God is stripping you of your idols so he can draw near with the warmth of his favor and reattach you to the father of all fathers, the light of all lights. That's what God is doing. That's what he's doing here with Ahaz. And don't attack Ahaz as being uniquely sinful. Don't attack the nation of Israel as being uniquely sinful. Everyone who stands up in faithfulness for the Lord, they all fall. David fell. Israel has fallen. Later Judah will fall. Because the lesson in this flow of redemption is that we're all sinners. Every one of us are sinners. That's why in your social circles, if evil is always outside of you, woo, I would be very careful. I would be very careful of finding evil always extraneous to you. It's in the Democrat Party. It's in the Republican Party. It's, it's, in, uh, it's in Russia. It's, it's in China. It's all over, and it is. But if that's your focus, wow. You need to pause. You need to pause, and you need to call upon the Lord. Now God in his mercy didn't stop that with Ahaz. He came to Ahaz through his prophet Isaiah and he said, ask a sign from the Lord your God. Well, that's really an open invitation. Go ahead, ask a sign. That's in verse 11. Let it be deep as Sheol. Sheol's the bottom place where people go when they died, according to the Israel faith, the Hebrew faith. It's down there. It's deep. And God says to Ahaz, ask for a sign. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as the heaven. 
wow, this makes I dream of genie irrelevant. Here's the true and living God who's created everything, whose power is beyond belief, and whose character defines all that is with his goodness. And he says, ask as deep as Shul and as high as the heaven. Just ask anything. Ahaz's response, verse 12, I I will not ask, I will not put the Lord to the test. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So godly. I mean, that's what Jesus said, didn't he? You shall not test the Lord your God. Ahaz is just exemplifying that humble spirit. Not so. God is the one who came to Ahaz. God is the one who said, ask. God is the one who said, ask deeply and highly. So deep and high that there's nothing that can exceed it. Ask away. And so he's hiding Because he already knows what he's connived in his heart. He already knows about the power alliances that he's forming. He knows it. So he's 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 playing cat and mouse with the Lord. It's just that he's he's deceived. You can't play cat and mouse with God. He knows too much. He's created you. He knows you better than yourself. He knows your thoughts before they leave your mouth. So then God comes back in verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. And whether you know it or not, even if you're an atheist, that happiness that drives you in its most profound and fundamental sense is a reflection of the Omega Day to be happy and to be with the one who has created you. God with us is what everyone covets. But because our hearts are idolatrous, those reflections of creational structure of being an image bearer of God, twist it, and we begin to make idols right away with it. Verse 15, he shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and the good, the land whose Two kings you dread will be deserted. Now I want you to understand this prophecy that's coming to Ahaz. In terms of its temporal flow of history, the prophecy is this. Before this child which is born knows how to discern good and evil, the two nations that you dread are going to be defeated. Therefore it can't be Christ. This Emmanuel isn't Jesus. But it is, because I believe Scripture gives us a two-layered meaning within prophecy at times. So there's a historical fulfillment here, and there can be some debate. Ahaz had a son. Isaiah himself goes into, uh, he has a son in chapter 8. And so those historical things are kind of the fulfillment of this prophecy. That's where Ahaz's worry is. That's where his anxiety is. It's in these two nations that are coming. And so the prophecy is, don't sign an allegiance with that other nation. I want you to trust. I want you to be careful. I don't want you to fear. I want your heart not to be faint here. Because these two nations are going down. Before this child can discern good and evil. So that's what Ahaz is thinking. And that's what Isaiah is thinking, at least on some obvious level. But there's another level. Because there's certain deficiencies in those historical fulfillments that keep them all off balance. And we could go through the deficiencies of the historical fulfillment of these prophecies that come to God's people from his prophets, and we can see how they don't quite yet match up. 
And so God is going somewhere with a kind of historical fulfillment, and then he go, takes them further to its ultimate fulfillment. This is the already not yet. This is the historical and the not yet historical that's coming. Okay. Chapter 7, uh, and all the way through chapter 10, is the unleashing of God's anger against Israel, warnings to Judah, and the nation that's going to defeat the two nations they fear. So, so God gives them this holistic picture of his movements within history. Assyria is eventually going to be judged. But Assyria, God is going to use to destroy the attack on Judah. You see, God is in control of the entire flow of history. And God decimates in prophetic fulfillment what's coming. And that's how chapter 10 ends. And God speaks of a remnant, but he's talking about the judgment that's coming because Ahaz did not trust, Ahaz did not wait, Ahaz did not tame his heart. Then comes chapter 11. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. A branch from his root shall bear fruit. You see, God takes the unlikely. God takes the lack of resources. So judgment has been announced upon Israel and Judah and Assyria against every nation. It's been announced. And then chapter 11 goes back to this miracle child and it starts to establish where and how this child comes. It shall come forth as a shoot from the stump of Jesse. Now Jesse's the father of David. Why does scripture use Jesse and not David? Why go back to the earthly father of the king of Israel that, that defines Israel, in which God makes through Samuel his eternal covenant shall not depart from your throne. Your lineage shall not depart from this throne because this covenant is a forever covenant. And so yet God in his spirit says a shoot's going to come from the stump of Jesse. Why Jesse? And I'll tell you why. Because it's so utterly hopeless. There's so utterly a lack of resources. David may, might conjure up a, a, a sense of pride that, that, that we have still something left. But God takes us back to the natural father in whom the natural people, he marched all these sons in front of him because David wasn't chosen, the ruddy little person who keeps sheep. God takes them back to their own definition of resources and security and he says, you don't have any. But out of that stump of Jesse, which David came, now we're going back to the stump of Jesse, and now the Davidic fulfillment is coming. I'm going to strip you of any possible sense that you have adequacy to do what I'm calling you to do. It's going to come and rise from the stump of Jesse. A branch from his roots shall bear fruit. A shoot, a stump, and a branch. This is God's movement in history now. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. That's what Ahaz couldn't do. Be careful, be quiet. Do not fear in the negative sense. Why? Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. But that fear Ahaz lacked, so he had the only fear he had was the fear of the oncoming attack of the nations. But this shoot from Jesse, the stump of Jesse, he is going to be marked by a delight in the fear of the Lord. Adam failed. Eve fe failed. Abraham failed, Moses failed, 
Samuel even failed. Certainly Saul failed. And David, the king, in whom the eternal covenant is made, he failed. They all fail. Ahaz's failure isn't unique. Ahaz, oh, if we just had another king, we could have pulled this off. No. Not so. All of these people are a shining example of you and me. Now, he shall not judge by what his eyes see. What happened when Israel wanted its first king? Ah, they put the first one forth. God said, no, not him. They gave the next best one of Jesse's sons. Not him. They all passed. And they were just baffled. Is this all you have? Is this everything you have? Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, bring him. Bring him. God is not going to judge with what the eyes see or settle disputes with what only the ears hear. God's Day of the Lord is going to open up each and every individual heart in the thoughts and its intents and desires. We're going to see evil for what it truly is. And even though there's civilly righteous people who do good and can be described as good people, good men and good women, their hearts are not coram Deo. And we will see that. But it's hidden. We just have to believe the text. That day is coming. It's coming. He's going to judge not by eyes and ears, but with righteousness. He will decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. That's the day of the Lord. The day of the day of the Lord. Now Christians differ. You know, are we talking millennium here, the thousand years? Verse 8, verse 6, The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fatted calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, the young shall lie, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Now there's some movement in Christendom that says that's going to happen literally when the thousand years happens in Revelation chapter 20, there's going to be a literal thousand year reign of Christ and that's when all of this comes to pass. Now, I commend their spirit because God's rule and reign will be visible and acknowledged. That's what they're fighting for. There's going to be righteousness not in some Far off distant planet, there's going to be righteousness on this planet that we have corrupted. Because we've refused and rejected God's reign and rule. It's coming to this planet. So that desire I commend. I think they're a little too wooden and carnal in their notion of how this gets fulfilled. Did the canine teeth disappear from the lion? Ah, uh, you know, what's a metaphor? Well, the end. And unfortunately, we have to leave so much out. Verse 9 of chapter 11 of Isaiah, They shall not hurt or destroy in all of my holy mountain." For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. See, God is not a killjoy. To be a Christian is not to indulge in some sort of self-hatred properly understood. Because God's final endgame is prosperity, is blessing, unbelievable goodness 
showered down upon his people. I hope that you will know that. I hope that you will strive for that. I hope that you will learn by your God-given spirit in being part of the new covenant to be careful, to be quiet, and not to fear all of this rattling that's all around us, which can yield to our persecution. It can yield our death, so scripture teaches, right from the get-go of this revelation. If you don't have Christianity in terms of your sights as something to die for, then you'll die for something else. And I don't fear death. I don't care how much rattling comes and how much substantive apparent defeat I am going to face. Because I'm called to place my trust and faith in his word. And Isaiah was not a utopian dreamist. He was a man who received the revelation of God, who's told us the end game and told us how God wants to respond and react in the midst of these two kingdoms in which one is attacking the other. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Bella, can you come up early and be ready to play the doxology for us, please? Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes to God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. On the night that our Lord was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. In the same way, he took the cup of blessing and when he had given thanks, he poured the fruit of the vine saying, this is the cup of the new covenant 
my blood shed for you for the remission of sins. This drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. blood of Christ shed for you. Ahaz was not able to tame his heart, neither are we. It's through the promise of God given to us in his Son, the Emmanuel, the God with us, in which our heart must cling, must trust, to be stable and have solidity. It's our only place, God says. Come and receive such from him. The blood of Christ shed for you. 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 shed for you. The blood of Christ 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 given for you. Blood of Christ given and shed for you. Amen. Now stand and let's sing together our new exited, exiting hymn for a while. Uh, number 103, fourth in the peace of Christ we go. Number 103 in the ensemble.
And now, hear the benediction of God, which comes to us from chapters 58 and 59 of Isaiah. Cry aloud. Do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgressions. To the house of Jacob their sins. And as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit that is upon you and my words that I have put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth or out of the mouth of your offspring or out of the mouth of your children's offspring, says the Lord, from this time forth and forevermore. Go in the confidence of God's eternal covenant that is coming to us through his Son, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, Jesus the Christ. Know his favor. It shall not be taken from you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming, and there's goodies on the table.